Welcome back. Super, super excited. We're going to talk about the 12 factor app methodology. Now, this is an important concept when we talk about delivering software or software as a service or creating web apps or app development or software development. It doesn't really matter. But either way, if you're developing software, the 12 factor app is an important methodology that we're going to take a look at. And the reason why it's important, because if you're a solutions architect or a DevOps engineer, whether in the AWS environment, ecosystem, or the Azure, Red Hat, IBM, whichever cloud you're actually working with or managing, perhaps, or if you're a developer, either way, the 12-factor app is going to help you. So let's take a look at what these, uh, what the methodology is and what those 12 factors are that you need to take a look at. So let's dive right in. Welcome back. Super, super excited. So the 12-factor app, many cases... In many instances, rather, the 12-factor app is leveraged within microservices. So it's important to cover this. And of course, whether you're working with AWS, whether you're working with Azure, you know, IBM Cloud, Red Hat, whichever cloud platform or ecosystem you're working within, the 12-factor app is an important um, you know, concept to take a look at. So I'm going to talk about the 12-factor apps. So just jump right in. Let me make this bigger. So you can read up on this, uh, just go to 12factor.net, pretty straightforward, so I'm not gonna read, of course, everything. But the important areas are that whenever you're working with developing software, developing apps, or web apps, software as a service, this is a methodology for building software as a service apps that uses primarily three or four, five things, right? But you can read up on this, I'm not gonna go through this, but the important thing that I wanna cover here in this lecture are the 12 factors themselves okay so the first factor is of course the code base itself one code base track and revision control many deploys this is a very good practice by the way think of this as best practices because you have one code base that is tracked by um, multiple revisions because um, the way software developments or the microservices or the tools that we use is using branches, right? So either you, you know, merge everything into the master branch uh, or you create individual private branches for each of the developers. So what happens is, you know, de developers are developing code and they are uh, working on their own tasks, right? So they're not, you know, working on, um, you know, no two developers, for example, are working on the same code. So they have their own, um, you know, task, which is again, if you work with Jira software, Atlassian, right? So you know how that works, but if you have not, um, check out my other videos on those. So once the task is assigned to a developer, the developer makes the changes right to the code and then commits the change into a branch. Now that branch or that process is basically the version controlling or the versioning, right? Which is very, very important. And the tool that is used is called Git. Check out my other videos on Git. Uh, that would be super, super cool to learn and definitely a must have tool to learn if you're in DevOps. All right, so one code base tracked and revision controlled many deploys. Make sense? Perfect. That's the number one factor uh, in the 12 factors. Number two is dependencies. So explicitly declare and then um, isolate those dependencies. You do not want to mix everything up. So make sure you are clear on which code is dependent on which, right? Number three is store your config in the environment. So whether you're working in the dev environment, whether you're working in the production environment or the QA environment or whichever environment you've set up for yourself, make sure you store the config files within those environments. Backing services is number four. So treat backing services as attached resources. Straightforward, self-explanatory. You want to be able to use those backing services as by themselves. Build, release, run is number five. Strictly separate build and run stages. Now, when we talk about build and run stages, we're talking about you know when the software change go through the pipeline. There's a code build that you use, and then of course you run the build itself to see if everything works fine, or if there are any errors, you check the log. So you want to be able to separate the build stage versus the run stage. Try not to mix them up in one go. Okay, it'll be easier for you to identify later on what's going on with your code. And then, of course, number six is processes. So execute the app as one or more stateless processes. So stateful and stateless, two concepts in software um, development or programming. Please go check out my video on that. I'm not going to 
dive deeper into this, but you want to be able to execute as one or more stateless processes. Port binding is export services via port binding. Um, typically, APIs are used at, at the later stage when we actually do this and then you know we, we run the application programming interface um, to tie in the different services, whether you're in AWS or any other uh, cloud platform. Concurrency, scale out via the process model. So again, check out the process model, check out my videos. You wanna be able to scale out using the process model. Disposability is number nine, which is maximize robustness with fast startup and graceful shutdown, straightforward. And then dev prod parity. Now dev prod parity is basically keeping development, staging, and production as similar as possible because you have two different you know, VMs or, or servers that are each of them maybe separately or on the same machine, doesn't, you know, depending on your architecture. So if you have, let's say, a dev uh, machine uh, or a production uh, server differently, so keep those environments sort of like similar. When we, when we say similar, that means make sure you're running the same services, make sure you're running the same uh, image, machine image, for example, if, if one is running Linux Ubuntu, the other one should also run Linux Ubuntu, right? So again, that's the idea of keeping the dev prod parity. And the reason is, is simple because let's say if you're, you know, your dev machine is running Linux and the prod machine is running Windows Server, right? Something like that. So you have to kind of manage, uh, you have to do extra things because you have to manage you know, Windows separately, it services, it's tools, you have to install them and whatnot, right? So keep that in mind. Logs treat logs as event streams. So logs is something, in my experience, I've seen that people only look at when there's a bug, there's a problem, they check, check the logs. So you want to be able to tie up the log with each event, right? So if you're working with CloudWatch or CloudTrail within AWS, for example, you want to be able to tie in logs with each event that occurs. That way, it's much, much easier to isolate and identify a certain or potential problem, right? All right, perfect. And then, of course, admin processes, which is number 12, run admin management tasks as one-off processes. So these are the 12 factors when we're looking at developing software, right? So the purpose, by the way, let's go back to the original purpose of the 12 factor app. The first is use declarative format for setup information. For example, if you're using Terraform, it uses declarative language, right? So you can use that and to minimize time and cost for new developers joining the project. Number two, have a clean contract with the underlying operating system, offer maximum portability between execution environments. And that I just, you know, we just talked about this, having a similar, similar environments. Number three, are suitable for deployment to modern cloud platforms, obviating the need for servers and system administration, right? So this basically, the 12-factor app is, again, a methodology for building your software, your apps, right, that are suitable for deployment on the cloud platform. So if you're developing and deploying it on AWS, it should be the same for Azure. It should be the same for IBM Cloud. It should be the same for Red Hat, right? That's the idea. Minimize divergence between deployment and production, enabling continuous deployment. And this is really part of the automation processes that, for example, a DevOps engineer would do. It would create a pipeline, automate all the processes uh, so that it's a seamless process for continuous delivery, continuous integration, and of course, continuous deployment as well. And this will help you gain maximum operational efficiency. And of course, the last thing is that we can scale up without significant changes to tooling architecture or development practices. So, like we said, keeping things simple and robust. And that is sort of like, yeah, a challenge, right? Sometimes for uh, DevOps engineers or, you know, other you know, cloud architects. But if you're able to manage or, you know, implement um, this strategy where your environments are pretty similar, your tools are pretty similar, it's much easier to scale up, okay? And uh, yeah, believe me, in the real world, if, if you're not able to scale up quickly, it adds up to the cost, it adds up to the time, and of course, then you're just doing a lot of meetings, guys, right? So you want to make sure that, uh, you know, whichever solution is architected is architected in such a manner that it's scalable, resilient, and robust, right? So if you've done the AWS Certified Solutions Architect course, um, yeah, you would know what I'm, you know, we're talking about the scalable architectures. So this is the 12-factor app. 
I um, hope this kind of makes sense. With this, let's dive into the next lecture.